Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another webinar series. The Gassi webinar series serves as a platform for the Gassi network members to share experience and expertise in evidence synthesis and share potential collaboration. As you see, we, you are all muted by default. So if you want to ask your question, please raise your hand to be unmuted so that you can ask your question directly to the presenter, or you can submit your questions and comments using the question panel. For those who are joining us for the first time, an overview of the, day of the stakeholder engagement webinar series. Stakeholder engagement is an integral part of all systematic reviews to some degree. However, there has been a little discussion of this important process in systematic review guidance to date, particularly in the field of environmental management and conservation. This series discusses various aspects of engaging with stakeholders, like describing the ranges of methods available, outlining experiences from various systematic review experts, and discussing issues related to conflict. The benefits of training, engaging directly with decision makers, and communicating review results. So today's webinar series is the second webinar in the stakeholder engagement webinar series, and it's about managing knowledge production and context of conflict by Dr. Annika Nielsen. So Dr. Annika Nielsen is an interdisciplinary researcher focusing on the politics of Arctic change, environmental governance, and the co-production of knowledge at the science policy interfa interface. She works as an independent researcher, including engagement with KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden and the Nordland Research Institute in Norway. She has recently been engaged in the Arctic Council's Arctic Resilience Assessment and in the Barton's Region Study for Adaptation Action for a Changing Arctic. Dr. Nielsen has a PhD in environmental science, as well as over 20 years of professional experience as a science writer before entering academia. Once again, thank you, Dr. Nielsen, for joining us today. I'm very happy that you're joining today, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to meet with you. I have not worked that much with systematic reviews. Uh, I've that way drew me into some some work, but my, my experience really comes from from other fields. I'm more of a kind. Of, sometimes I call myself an undisciplined researcher, but towards the political science field, and uh, uh, and as Nadia said, with an interest in, in politics of Arctic change. But I've worked with several scientific assessment processes relating to pollution in the Arctic and social issues in the Arctic, and also in my own research looked at knowledge production about climate change in the Arctic. And uh, uh, scientific assessments, in a sense, have many similarities to systematic reviews in that they build on a strong belief in knowledge as an important input in policy making and decision making. And while I fully agree on the importance of knowledge for good decisions, I wouldn't question that. It's important to remember that knowledge is really only one aspect of decision making, so one aspect that needs to inform decision making in society. And maybe even more important, knowledge is often contested even if it's based on, on available scientific evidence. And in some cases, even the knowledge production process as such, the, the scientific process is contested. Uh, there used to be a notion uh, that all would be well if only science could speak truth to power. But we know today from many studies at the, of the science policy interface that the picture is much more complex and actually from my perspective more interesting, but I study these processes. For those of you who try to influence policy and try to systematize available knowledge, it just makes it more challenging. But it has implications for the, for the power of systematic reviews and for the role of systematic reviews, not least in relation to stakeholder engagement, which of course is the topic for the seminar series. 
And as, as Nadia said, I'm a researcher at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, and mainly engaged in a Nordic center of excellence, working on issues related to resource extraction and sustainable Arctic communities. And I will take some of the examples from, from that field today, because it is definitely one in which knowledge and contest contested issues and conflicts are, are very much in place. But before going into to the details, I want to give a little bit more of the context we're moving in and why the topic of, of looking at stakeholder engagement as part of a contested knowledge issue is very relevant at this moment in time. I would argue that we have today a shifting landscape of contested futures. And it's, if we go back in time, it seems, if we go back in time a long time, you know, things seem to be just continuous as they were. If we go back in time, maybe 30 years, there was a notion that everything is progress, everything is going to be better. Today, we live in a time where that's not, so easy to say anymore. Uh, we live in a time of very rapid social and environmental change where the ground is shaking. And that means that the future is being renegotiated. So, so we, we kind of just, so where, where do we want to go? And the stakes are quite high. It's not as if we can get everything we want. And that creates in a sense, a tense situation in and of itself. Uh, where you also have a situation where common aspirations, such as getting better material welfare, being able to travel, uh, everyone having a good economy, uh, is no longer seen as sustainable at least not the way it has been practiced by Western countries so far. And that, of course, challenges the, the, the people who are in power today, the people who are in a good situation today. So new knowledge, for example, about environmental change and, and impact and the, the impact of the, and the consequences of the decisions and the lifestyle we have, that type of information is actually often perceived as an existential threat. It's not just new neutral information, it challenges people to question their life choices and their lifestyles, and sometimes even their identity. We also live at a time where power relations are shifting uh, in many different ways. In, in geopolitical power relations are shifting uh, to, towards Asia compared to the old world, but also among generations. Uh, young generation, uh, large populace of young generation coming with different values, different ideals. We see this in Sweden, which is where I sit, with, with Greta Thunberg and her, her challenging politicians about why aren't you doing anything about climate change and getting young people all over the world to, to, to actually call call on the older generation so so what what are you doing you're destroying our future so that is and that those people are in voting power in not too many years and on top of it they have a virtual media landscapes that creates completely new conditions for communication much more rapid but also uh, creating media bubbles so it's a we live in a completely different landscape than I would say 20, 30 years ago, which is when I started working on, on these issues. And that means that also knowledge becomes contested. And there is a renegotiation of the role of, of science in society. And that creates a need to recognize what, what what science can do and what it cannot do. And thereby also, I would say, what systematic reviews can do and what they cannot do. Uh, and um, 
first of all, and this is something Sheila Jasanoff wrote, has written a lot about. I put one reference in the end slide. I have the full references for these these papers that were kind of cornerstone papers in the development of this thinking. Is we have to recognize that knowledge is not something neutral, objective, that's that's there. It's something that is negotiated and co-constructed in a dialogue between whatever we are studying, whether it's a ecosystem or a society, and those who are studying it, whether those are researchers, whether it's politicians or whoever. It's, it's that knowledge comes out of a relationship where people are involved not only people but also institutional structures and while it might be possible to answer a specific scientific question in a reasonably objective manner the body of knowledge that is produced and highlighted in political decision making is a product of a number of social and political processes ranging from science funding the organization of academia power relations in society and uh, that is, I think, fairly well recognized now by many people, but not necessarily by, by people who work in hardcore natural sciences, uh, where it's seen as something bad, whereas when I describe it is more an observation of that, that's how it how it functions. It's, it's not, I don't put a value in it that it would be negative, that that's the case. Uh, but it also means that it becomes very difficult to make a clear distinction between what is a stakeholder and what is a knowledge producer. In the previous webinar in the series, Neil Hathaway gave a more general introduction to stakeholder engagement, and I assume some of you have, have listened, listened to that as well. And it, here I want to highlight that it's not really possible to differentiate between the knowledge producers and stakeholders. What you may call stakeholders are also knowledge providers, or at least knowledge holders, while those of you may those who you may recognize as experts very often have their own stake in in the process and in the knowledge production processes whether it be systematic review or empirical research these things can for example be related to career or other social rewards uh, not only what you may initially think of as stakes in a, a political issue so who is a knowledge proposer, knowledge producer and who is a stakeholder requires some reflection Third, and this is something that comes very much from insights from studying scientific assessment. There was a large project that uh, global environmental assessments, looking at them, evaluating them, the, which was reported by Mitchell et al. in 2006, uh, that scientific credibility is not sufficient, but that it must be accompanied also by salience and process legitimacy. A and it came from an observation that you have loads of scientific assessments, but only a few of them actually have an impact on policy. Uh, and even if they were had very high scientific credibility, it did not guarantee having having any impact. And what they showed by looking at many of these processes, both internationally and in national context, is that and this one is probably f fairly obvious to you, that the question posed by the assessment have to be seen as relevant, as salient to, to the people who you're trying to reach. And that might be pretty obvious. What is might be less recognized is that the knowledge production process must be perceived as legitimate. And how what is legitimate depends on who you ask. For a scientist, a natural science person, the, the scientific process itself creates legitimacy. And in the systematic review processes, we, we tend to think of that the transparency and the systematic matter of a review process would create a process legitimacy. But that's not necessarily true for all audiences. 
for example, it might not be relevant for an audience who would rely on an oral tradition as more legitimate than written, written uh, evidence. So what is, what is a legitimate process depends who you're trying to reach. And unfortunately, what is credible, salient and legitimate legitimate to one target audience may not be equally credible, salient and legitimate to another target audience who also need to be convinced. So, but, but looking at these three aspects at least makes you think of what you have to have in mind and try to look at your own process from the outside, from the view of who you're trying to reach. Uh, and I think one of the things that have I have had to think hard about more and more, having my own background comes from actually being a science journalist initially and having worked with science communication. And we we I think we have been a bit naive that if we can only come with new tools and approaches and flashier way of presenting our material and, and better language, it, we would be re able to reach. But we have, I come to realize that that's not where the problem is often. The, the problem lies somewhere else. It's not a matter of being a good communicator only. So we need to critically assess how we think about science communication. And we need to think about it in the very beginning of the knowledge production process. It's not a matter of translating scientific results to, to flashy usable language for, for decision makers. And on top of it, sometimes something that I mentioned earlier, we live in a time where you have media bubbles that create parallel knowledge landscapes and fact resistance uh, and various different groups frame the whole issue in different ways. Uh, there are several examples so that are quite well studied in the view of vaccinations, child vaccination is a very clear examples where you have a strong strong scientific basis and strong public health incentives to to vaccinate for many of, of what's called childhood diseases while while also quite a substantial group of people well educated people don't believe in it don't believe those messages and of course climate change is a is another classic where there's also quite a bit of research showing how the how that links the 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 media bubbles and the knowledge resistant links to 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 uh, political ideologies. So um, we need to be humble. Uh, we also need to be humble about the limits of science and limits of knowledge. Uh, it cannot, science cannot solve all of society's challenges. They can only, it can only address specific questions. And the questions posed also depends on who has power to pose questions. And uh, but what, what questions are not, because they're not scientific. And uh, we need to think about can knowledge really be uh, uh, objective in an unequal world where some actors have a voice, have do not have a voice in defining what is relevant. This photo is from the Arctic Council ministerial meeting in Kiruna in Sweden in 2013. The Arctic Council is a, is a collaboration among the Arctic count, eight Arctic countries in the circumpolar north. Uh, but it also shows the, you know, the diplomatic car coming and you have representatives of the Sami community in the background saying new Arctic mining. And what the, the power relations in these pictures are quite obvious and they were also obvious actually inside the meeting where I happen to be. Uh, and it goes behind a scientific question. It comes in a history of colonialism, questions about human rights, indigenous people's rights. That includes not only the explicit political processes weighing conflicting interests and 
against each other, but also power of defining what knowledge is and what knowledge is relevant when assessing the impacts of mining. So the, the link, sometimes there the used to be, oh, we need to keep science and politics apart, but you can't. They're always intertwined. And we need to recognize the limits of science and that some issues are political at their core. And as I mentioned, I have some examples here from, from uh, uh, resource extraction in the Arctic based on ongoing research in two projects. One is uh, within the Nordic Center of Excellence, REX, Resource Extraction and Sustainable Arctic Communities. And the other is a project where I was involved at the start, which is focusing on mapping the impacts of mining using multiple knowledges, where a systematic review of published literature, kind of rather classic in the systematic review sense, is only one aspect, and where another aspect is empirical work together with the Sami reindeer herding community to gather their knowledge that is often not written down or documented and actually often dismissed as just feelings or opinions. Especially when you start getting in, in, in situations where it's contested land use. Uh, a company wants to open a mine uh, on land that has traditionally been used for reindeer herding, for example. Uh, in, in REXAC, one, one question relates to the need to reform processes related to environmental impact environmental impact assessment. And currently the focus is quite local and the emphasis on potential impacts on the environment such as water, soil, air and biodiversity at the kind of biotope and species level. And if you look at these, the social and economic aspects are not discussed in at all the same detail. That knowledge is not weighed in, counted. Another question is what scale should be in focus? Is it the very local impacts of mining of, you know, the, the kind of close vicinity to a mine? Or is it the large scale system that the fact that the mine generates the building of roads and railroads uh, requires energy, uh, has maybe pollution that's transported via river far down, downstream, all of these issues. How, where, where do you draw the line for where the environmental impact assessment that the company has to do is, is should be responsible, even if it's control, not in control of the mining companies? And even questions such as when we talk about economic consequences, should the focus be on the national economy the next 10 years or the local economy in the next 100 years? And these are questions that go to the heart of how we define sustainable development, where the local focus currently is often not very well uh, articulated. For the 3MK project, and not, by now you had a chance to look at it a little bit, I, I invite you to take a look, close look at the lower image here. What do you see? Uh, I mean, it's contradictory information, but even if you recognize it after a while, it usually takes a little while before you see it. You, you, your eye is drawn to one picture, but not the other. And you could equally say, is it drawn to people needing jobs that would come from a mine, or is it people having their livelihoods threatened, such as reindeer herders? Or do you see another small detail in a, an environment that's already encroached and, and maybe you think destroyed, or is it is it actually doing something to a pristine environment? Are you looking at a local system or a global system? So these are some examples of how, how knowledge is not as simple as one would, one would want it to be. And I want to, since my guess is that most of you may not come from a background of philosophy of science, I want to place what I have discussed so far into a framework of, of more theory, theoretical understanding of the role of science in society. Uh, an early recognition of the complexity of 
knowledge in relation to decision making came with the notion of wicked problems. It comes from Rittel and Weber in, in 1973, which really was a way to describe what call, calls problems that have multiple causes, maybe nonlinear dynamics, often the lacking definitive solutions and linked to alternative policy frames. I, climate change is a, a very, very good example of a wicked problem. It, you cannot describe it in a, in a simple science. You cannot reduce it to one single scientific question that you can answer. You can certain aspects of it. You can, you know, the atmospheric dynamics you can study with scientific methods. You cannot address the whole problem of climate change in society uh, with only scientific methods. It's, it's, too, it's too complex. Uh, a next step in a sense in the recognition of, um, of the complexity and the role of so, uh, science in society, what's called post-normal science, uh, uh, a uh, notion that Fentovich and Ravitz uh, wrote about in 93. And they really focused on then uh, scientific management. Certainly, they recognized the wicked problems. So, what does one do with it? What do you do with as a scientist with some, something like this? But they remain within the scientific paradigm. And but, but add then a commitment to solving it with, with, with specific activities and dialogue, for example, management of, of uncertainty that is inevitable. I think IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is a very good example of a, of a body that was created with that kind of thinking in mind. Uh, you have all kinds of examples of how they try to manage uncertainty while staying within a scientific paradigm and, and even if it's a very much of a science policy interface trying to safeguard the scientific credibility by always managing that inf inf interface. However, I think what we see now is that the very role and status of science and society is, is uh, challenged. And it's, of course, very problematic in the sense uh, of the consequences of fact resistance, some of which I mentioned earlier. But one could also turn it around and see it as positive that is also recognition of alternative epistemologies, alternative ways of knowing, for example, the upgrading of local and indigenous knowledge, and the kind of the recognition that science, scientific methods are not the only ways of knowing and that each way of knowing has its uh, kind of strengths and weaknesses so you can start having a dialogue around that. That's the positive aspect of it but of course you have to get to the dialogue in order to in order to get the positive aspects and not get stuck in the fact resistance and, and all that. So then what are the implications of all of this for, for systematic reviews? You might think that this was kind of a detour for what you're really interested in, in systematic reviews. So uh, in this, what, what we tried to do, me together with a colleague, Rasmus Klokelaas, and we tried to uh, put this all into a kind of a heuristic framework uh, that could help guiding systematic reviews and it, th this is published and and uh, you you can find it uh, oh you get the reference at the end so what i would like to do is kind of go around go around this circle and the importance is important is to think of where are you what kind of problem do you have when you're what do you problem what kind of problem do you want to address and what how do you have to think when you think about stakeholder involvement and kind of knowledge production in general so so starting in the lower right corner what type of conflicts are you talking about we can start in the beginning is it a knowledge based conflict well, then normal science and systematic reviews might serve you quite well, especially if you can define the 
the issue clearly enough. However, if it's a wicked problem, you may have to think differently. And going into the inner circle, if, the, if it is a knowledge-based problem, the, the stakeholder involvement might be more of a consultation. Objectivity might be relevant to talk about and you know, generality becomes a measure of quality. However, if it's a wicked problem, Now let's have to think of which direction I'm going. Because I don't see the whole picture in my, <laughs> my screen, so I have to look at a paper. Uh, if you go one step up and look at uh, post-normal science, you have a more wicked problem, a recognition that it's co-constructed your view of knowledge you get a different view of knowledge that you have to take into account and the measure of quality here would be stakeholder relevance maybe more than or not instead of but in addition to to what you would think of as scientific quality it's not just any scientific study that's relevant to include it's one that actually addresses the issue that needs to be addressed according to stakeholders and your stakeholder involvement, the goal might be to think of social learning. How do you create a process in which the various actors can actually learn from each other? Which is a different type of task than only consulting them and asking them for something. You might have to create a workshop setting, you might have to cre create a Trust, social trust that actually makes it possible to learn. If we then go to the, the outer circle and end up in a situation where you have a destructive conflict, and I will go into different kinds of conflicts later, but a destructive conflict is one that is no one really wants and it's not moving anything forward, it's not helping anyone. Uh, you might have different views on what knowledge is actually is or what knowledge is relevant. Uh, some may think certain knowledge is just feelings or myths uh, or that other knowledge is some kind of bogus science. And when it comes to measures of quality then you might have to think of can you at least get to a point where you can get a mutual recognition and a, and a common sense of what, what we're talking about to get beyond where you are in a situation of a destructive conflict? Get into a constructive conflict where you can start teasing it apart and actually move forward. And in stakeholder involvement, you might have to think of what are the power relations between different groups? Can you create a situation where everyone actually has a chance to speak and share their knowledge and perspectives? What does equality in practice mean? Does it mean changing the settings? Uh, Rasmus Klokelarsson, for example, has worked with doing, doing uh, assessments, uh, impact assessment together with the Sami community without anyone from the outside. In, in a facilitated process where you can kind of isolate at one point in time from a situation where it, it's actually quite conflictual. But that of course also requires resources and it's a question of who has resources to put into the process. So that's what equality in practice is. And there you can think of all kinds of dimensions. It can be gender dimensions, it can be different ethnic groups, it can be different um, practices, it can be different countries. There are all kinds of dimensions that need to be taken into account when looking at equality in practice. And as I said, uh, conflicts can have many different dimensions and here's some to, to help you sort sort out what may be relevant. Uh, is it a, that you can think of when you when you 
consider whether to do a systematic review and when consider planning it, is it a destructive or a constructive conflict that you're dealing with? Uh, if a destructive conflict and people aren't talking to each other and, and they're ready to hit each other in the head, it might be a different approach that you need to take than if you already have a constructive dialogue. And it's a matter of, of looking more specifically at finding facts. Is it based on different facts or different knowledges? Is it, uh, is it a knowledge-based conflict to start with or is it a different type of conflict? Maybe conflict based on interests or is it maybe based on different perceptions of reality? Or as I said, incommensurable specific interest. If you have a piece of land in northern Sweden, you cannot use the same piece of land for a mine, for reindeer herding and for tourism and for wind power. Those, those interests are likely to be incommensurable. You cannot solve that with more knowledge. It's a political process that has to be carried out that can move that forward. And then we have the more loaded issues. Is, is the conflict based on perceptions of past wrongdoings? Uh, colonial heritage does play a role in northern uh, in, in across the Arctic and I think in many, many other parts of the world. Uh, what does that do uh, to the discussion? And, and link to that, what role and sense of power or powerlessness are there among the participants, both past and present? And what role do emotions play? And that can be just, it can be hope, or oh, we really want to invest in this mine because we're going to earn a lot of money and that will that will not only be good for a company, but it could even be important for a country. Um, in the case of Greenland, for example, uh, as a means towards independence from Denmark. So, so really high stakes. Or fear, fear of losing your livelihood, fear of losing your place of where you live, a fear of losing something that's important to your identity. And I think having a starting reflecting on what kind of conflict you're dealing with can narrow down what a systematic review in the, in the classical sense can actually be useful for and what it cannot be useful for and where there might be other means of moving further. Uh, and this is in a sense a, a summary of uh, of some of the things I've said that, that you can use in a sense as a guide. Uh, some of the two, two previous pictures, two previous slides, you can use as a guide for, for doing that assessment yourself uh, before starting a systematic review. Is, it a, is the question one well-defined, closed framed, or is it a wicked problem? Is it potentially irreconcilable problem definition or coexisting diverging questions? Is the evidence there in published scientific and gray literature or can be gathered from quantitative or qualitative scientific analysis? Or is it a matter of filling primary data gaps highlighted by stakeholders, exploring interpretations through social learning? Uh, or do you actually have to start a whole new process of uh, uh, generating evidence in joint fact findings? And that might not be then a systematic review process in, in how you, in more classical definition. And the review team then has, has different roles uh, in, in the normal science column, it's experts and scientific independence becomes important, whereas in a post-normal science involving stakeholders in framing the whole process, making it legitimate, uh, for example, by identifying research questions and seeking consensus becomes important. Whereas in, in a conflict management situation, you, you, you have to be careful to try to force a consensus, which the risk is that some people will walk out. Uh, and and uh, 
instead involving stakeholders directly in answering the questions, which then becomes kind of contradictory to some of the norms in systematic reviews of scientific independence. So you, you can see here where systematic review may not be the relevant tool to move forward on, on in an issue where you have a contest. What do you think it might be about contest knowledge? And the stakeholder group also comes very different roles. Is it you only consult them about something you already know what you're doing, or do they actually have decision-making authority and early involvement in the, in the planning, or they might not form a group at all and might have several different meetings because they don't to each other in, in a productive manning, manner. Uh, and you might have, have to have expertise in facilitation to, to, get, to get equality in practice, actually getting everyone a chance to be heard. I talked a lot about stakeholders and I had this slide first in the beginning and now I, then I moved it to the end, but I think it's, um, I think it's also important to think who is a stakeholder is. Is it knowledge users, which is the more classical decision, classical way of thinking about it, or affected parties, directly or indirectly, or a knowledge provider? And as earlier I said, the, the, the line between knowledge provider and stakeholder is, is not necessarily so clear. And we also have to think of what status different stakeholders have. They have legal rights and sharp rules about consultation. That can sometimes, uh, not in all countries, but sometimes be the case in environmental impact assessment, but not in all countries. It varies. Do they have rights by ethical norms, such as human, human rights, indigenous people's rights, not sharp legal uh, requirements? Or maybe they have have a status by the power, the economic, political, or brute force power. Uh, the companies, for example, or maybe by soft means, they can affect your reputation by shaming or endorsing you. So, so there, there you have to think about different roles of stakeholders. And then, in summary, I'm reasonably in time, I see. To, to, to summarize, and this is repetition of what, what the question that you might want to keep in mind in planning for a systematic review in an issue area where some conflicts could be an issue. Is the issue in focus mainly about knowledge or facts that can be assessed in a systematic manner, or does it include other dimensions, such as conflicting interests, conflicting worldviews? What role can your review process play in a larger context of the issue at hand? You're not the only knowledge, knowledge process, you're not the only process that's possible to, to take. Uh, and in, in assessing that, is, is the systematic review likely to reduce or exacerbate conflicts? How will the larger context affect your credibility and legitimacy of your review process. And you should never assume that it's neutral. Uh, you go in there and you might think you're objective and neutral, but you affect the context, you affect the situation. And that's of course often the ambition. What's the point otherwise of doing the work? Uh, but it's easy as a scientist to think that you're neutral when you aren't. And you might also want to think about what other processes regarding knowledge and power can you affect and be affected by. So that is in summary and here are some, uh, some of the cited literature and, and, and resources that I mentioned and you will get the slides, so you will have this uh, in your inbox or however that is being distributed so you don't have to sit and try to copy it. And uh, here's just where you can reach me and at rexac.org you can see if you're interested specifically in Arctic resources and extractive industries you can see a little bit about what we're doing in that project. So that's it. 
and I'm very open for your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Annika Nielsen. This was a very interesting presentation. So uh, we will take questions right now. Hello, Mahmoud. Yes, hello. Are you listening to me? Yes, yes we, we hear, you. hear you. Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful talk, actually. Um, um, it's very constructive and um, uh, I, I got I got one comment here. Well, um, I agree with the speaker regarding to implementation this um, engagement um, framework and, and from the high longer perspective. It sounds good if you like um, implementing this framework in Sweden or in European country, but I can't see it's very challenging uh, when it comes to LOMIC. Um, since we that, that we, we have faced a lot of issues regarding to limited access to like published literature in a day with the human resource and health research. We got like a lack of funding. And also we got problem that everybody knows that that's knowledge translation deficit issues. So I didn't know this is my first comment. I didn't know how this fit from the from the high lumbar perspective. Uh, from sorry from lumbar perspective. My second question is back to your theoretical framework, which is good. Um, actually, there's two components here when you speak about the view, the view of knowledge. Um, I, can't, I couldn't see the cultural perspective here. So where the cultural, uh, I mean, the transcultural issue um, fit in, in that model. And also, um, you, 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 you speak nicely about uh, how you I mean, in terms of a process, how you involve with the stakeholder involvement. Uh, but I couldn't see. What did you say? Can you, repeat, uh, can you repeat what you said just? The, you can see. Sorry. So, back to your model. So, yeah, I got two issues in your models here that I need to ask. Um, so, you, you, in your model, there's a, there's a way, the process of viewing knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the other, yeah, so you, you get, and the other one is how to stakeholder involvement. Mm -hmm. um, so, but but in as as you can see in your model, we I couldn't see that. I'm, I'm talking from like lomic perspective, where the cultural and transcultural issue will fit mm -hmm. in terms of yeah. So so I couldn't see that uh, in terms of viewing the knowledge because I I would say that cultural issues will impact definitely the way of people or scientists to view the knowledge. Um, other issue is regarding to the stockholder involvement. So in, 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 in logic perspective, we got like poverty, social injustice. Um, it's, 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 it's a big dilemma to involve, I mean, literacy, uh, low education, low social economics. Mm -hmm. So where empowerment, where empowerment could fit? Uh, um, so, so what I would, um, I'll just summarize and conclude what I'm trying to, to, to yeah. say here is, is, is that, it's 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 that model will be definitely fit um, in 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 high lomic. It's very applicable. But when it comes to apply what you have said in lomic perspective, yeah. it's very challenging at the moment. So um, we yeah. need to like working to modify. I'm not saying modify, but we need to find the solutions um, or how this brilliant. Actually, I like the framework. Actually, I like it so much. But in terms of whether it's fit to long perspective, like I'm, I'm, to, I'm talking from South Africa, I didn't do this myself. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm from University of Cape Town, Department of Medicine, yeah. uh, Evidence Based Research Unit. So I can see very I'm, much, I'm so from, yeah. I so very that's, much that's, like that's, your question. And, and let's see if I can, I, th I think the, the, the transcultural issue. Uh, it, it's not explicit in here. Uh, uh, I, I agree with that and it could be made much more explicit, but actually the transcultural issue is very much present in, in, the, in, in the context of, of the Arctic in relation, for example, to indigenous peoples and, 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 and larger society. And I think uh, what, what one could think of is, is elaborating because it's you have the transcultural issue there are both in a, in a sense can be view of knowledge can look very different different worldviews uh, to start with uh, but also things like what do you 
what you see as quality in one culture is not necessarily the same thing as you see as quality yes. in, in yeah. another. So, so I think I I agree with you. You you could, in a sense, the transcultural issue applies to several aspects here and could be brought out much stronger than than we did in our article. And when it comes to 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 um, uh, issues of social injustice and illiteracy. I think that that can very much be elaborated further uh, than I did when you taught equality in practice, uh, yeah. because that actually refers to the thing that you can't, it's not enough to, you know, yeah. or you send out invitations to take part in something. Some people have you no know, possibility to take part in it, and even if they would want to, because they can't leave their job because they have to earn a living. Yeah. How do you then create a situation that actually makes it possible for them sure. yes. to take yes. part? And that that yeah. of course is is context specific. You can't you yeah. can't provide one answer for South Africa that's also relevant for northern Sweden. You have to know the social context in which you're working to to and that I think is true also when you talk about social learning. How do you create a setting where people mm. actually can mm. listen and talk to each other in exactly. a constructive manner, yeah. that is not the same in, mm. in Stockholm, Sweden, in northern Sweden or in, in South Africa. You have to know the cultural context you're in. So I, I very much agree with and those are things that I think would be, should be elaborated on further. I agree with you there. Thank you very much. That's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mahmoud, for your question. And of course, these are often not things that you can, you know, it's not a simple question, it's more to put thoughts in your head that you probably need to think about and mull over and discuss with your colleagues. And, and, and as the previous person talked about, you have to you have to discuss it with your colleagues in the specific context that where you're working, whether it's the cultural context or the type of issue you're asking so uh, we have and i think monica. that's my my point in reflect so we have monica morrison who yep. wants to ask a question monica can you hear us very much really really useful and uh, relevant uh, i'm i'm working in northern botswana where we currently have the issue of elephant control and management. So all of this is, this is speaking to, to what's going on here. But uh, what I wanted to ask you was, was uh, how important is it to have um, transdisciplinary teams? And when you're looking at something so complex as planning a systematic review with at all of these stages and possibly at the, the outermost ring, which is, which is heavily con conflicted, who does what? Where do you start? You know, you're putting together a team to do this. Who do you? Now you disappeared the end of your question, but I I got as far as who who who, who do you involve in 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 planning these kinds of projects? And I think uh, I mean the the thing is I think to realize that it's not sufficient with expertise in the in the specific question. In scientific question, you need, in a sense, expertise in the cultural context you're working. Uh, that could be uh, local involvement in and of itself, or it can be, in some context, maybe someone in anthropology, or it can also be someone uh, with expertise in facilitation. Uh, how do you run a workshop in a specific context so it works? Uh, that is. Uh, knowledge in and of itself. In the 3MK project, we were quite a diverse group. Uh, I'm not involved anymore because I've left SEI where, where the project is, but, but we had some people who were experts in systematic reviews and the methodology. Uh, we have one person, Rasmus Klocke Larsen, my, 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 my colleague who is co author of the article, who has worked very closely with Sami communities directly so and has worked a lot with facilitation issues and then I was involved in a sense looking at the stakeholder uh, mapping and and doing those kinds of work in that kind of work initially uh, but I think it, it 
I think w a good way of start is to, is to actually ask yourself, what type of knowledge do I need? And think broader than relating to the question and think about the process. You need knowledge about how to set up the process. I hope that answers your uh, question. Thank you, Dr. Annika. Monica, uh, we're sorry we lost you at the end, so I hope Dr. Annika answered your question. Um, but uh, you can always contact her through her email, as she said. Yeah. And um, I don't think we have other questions. So uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Annika, for being here with us for this webinar. Thank really you very much for giving me the opportunity. It was, and I really appreciate the questions that came and made me also have to think further. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what's nice. That's what's nice. And thank you everybody for joining us today. So please stay tuned for the coming uh, stakeholder engagement webinar series next month up until February 2020. Thank you. Bye.